Before we get outside, today's video is sponsored by BetterHelp. If you don't know what BetterHelp is, it's a platform online where you can get therapy. All you simply do is fill out a survey and they will match you with a ther therapist that meets your needs. From there, you can choose to talk to them via face-to-face, -face, over the phone, or even group sessions. Now, BetterHelp has meant the world to me personally and many of you already do know I lost my mom to addictions less than a year ago and then less than a month after that I lost two grandmas in the same week one of which was essentially my mom because my mom was you know in the throes of addiction and a lot of people ask me the question how how do you keep going how do you work a full-time job have a youtube channel instagram and always a smile on your face and honestly it's because of therapy. It gives me management of my feelings and allows me to still do the things I enjoy, like gardening. And without it, to be honest, I'd probably be on a couch watching TV rather than being out in the garden. It also helps with seasonal depression because, yeah, I know, it's end of April and it's snowing outside. <laughs> So if you want to check out BetterHelp, be sure to click the link down below in the pinned comment. You can join over 4 million other people over on the BetterHelp app. And that link will also give you 10% off to BetterHelp, my sponsor. So thank you, BetterHelp, for sponsoring today's video and helping me to improve my life drastically uh, through some pretty pretty rough and tumble times. Uh, it means truly the world to me. And you guys, I'll see you in the garden. And just so we know, all the footage that you're about to see was filmed before the snowstorm. So that's all just false advertising at this point. The blooper reel on this thing is going to be unbelievable. We are going to be going on a wild ride, just like I did last night. Today, we are looking at microbes, the science behind them. Do they matter? How do you increase them? Do you need to increase them? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This video is probably gonna lead you into wanting to watch my video I'm also filming today on compaction. So microbes, let's get into it. If you think my brain's gonna retain, retain, retain it all, considering I can hardly speak, not gonna happen. A soil without microbes can sustain no life. And that would be the only case that I would say that the soil is actually just dirt. Now the reason for that is because microbes are responsible for biogeochemical processes, which is just a big word for the conversion of nutrients or compounds into different nutrients and compounds, if you will. So nitrogen cycle is a great example. Sulfur cycle, great example. There are several different forms of microbes. There are algae, protozoa, nematodes, bacteria, fungi. Bacteria and fungi and nematodes and protozoa can be bad and they can also obviously be good. Now, someone who really stresses this is Eileen Ingham. So you guys, you know, follow her. Many of you follow her and she is a microbiologist. So if there's anyone that's going to know the ins and outs of what each bacteria and what each friggin' fungi species does, she's the person to talk to, not me. But I can give you a high level overview and I can make it fun and really, really digestible. So the question becomes, how do you know which ones you have in your soil? Because like I said, a soil without these is a dead soil and it cannot support anything. The answer to that question is, there is no way you don't have something in your soil because if we look at the planet and its population and we say the planet is overpopulation for its big particle size if you will the soil think of each little clay particle each little sand particle as its own world and on that world it is just jam packed with microbes now things can hurt microbes in a very located space so you can have toxins to microbes that will temporarily kill them off. Example, synthetic fertilizers do a temporary die-off. 
Um, pesticides sometimes have a temporary death. Other ones actually increase the micro populations. I know that sounds bizarre, don't shoot the messenger, but it's true. That can help increase them. Solarization, a weed control method, organic weed control method, can kill them. Tillage, tillage can actually kill them on the surface. So these are all ways that microbes can struggle. The good news is within 72 hours, 48 to 72 hours, the accepted time frame, that whole area is repopulated because it turns out whenever there's an overpopulation problem, it's because whatever is overpopulating is very good at making babies. They love to get down with it and bacteria definitely like to get down with it. So don't worry about it. There's nothing you could have done to just nuke your soil. It's not a thing. So even if you've done any of the things I'm about to tell you kills them, you're good. You're good. It's all redeemable. So what controls them? What makes them suddenly die off? What makes them thrive and survive? Well, it's something called edaphic factors. Yes, it's a big world word, but if you're new to this channel, hi, my name's Ashley and we garden with science. So that is a word you're going to have to learn. I tried to tone down on the science. Turns out you guys are nerds. Your geek crew like me, this is our space. If you don't like it, leave. Edaphic factors are essentially chemical and physical properties of the soil that harm or change the living space for microbes. So for example, my video on soil texture, we went over sand, silt, and clay. And depending on what type of soil type you have, you have different porosity size. Different porosity size or bulk density of your soil can result in higher or lower levels of microbes, particularly if you have a higher bulk density, aka clay, with too much water. And too much water means no air, and no air means anaerobic conditions. So the only bacteria that can survive in those conditions are anaerobic ones. The ones that do all the decomposition are aerobic, meaning they need oxygen. So a chemical physical property, an edaphic factor, such as too much water in a high bulk density soil, can result in no microbes. Other ones on the list for what can <laughs> affect this is the length of time that the soil is actually saturated, soil pH, texture, moisture, mineral nutrient content, organic material, and actually the depth, which we're going to get to here in a little bit. Soil can be split up into two layers, if you will, the upper layer and the lower layer. That is not a soil profile. The soil profiles inside of that are a totally different topic that I can do at a different time. But the, the macro or the major soil horizons, if you will, is the upper portion and the lower portion. The upper portion, what I'm sitting on right now, is where most of your microbes do reside. And there's the highest not only number, but also species distribution. There's a ton in every single category I've mentioned before. Now you're probably wondering, well, how do you know that? Well, Aline Ingham, for example, will teach you how to look at it through a microscope. And the way you do that through a microscope is to actually physically count them or look at the density of them. That is one way to do it. Another way to do it is actually through the Petri dish method. So you pop these bad boys, and what you do is you take the soil, you put it in water, you dilute it in a ratio that makes sense based on bulk density. You put a swab inside of that water, you take the petri dish, and then you do your petri dish swabbing technique. It's actually, it's like da 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 da, -da and then you go this way. Anyways, <clears throat> there's actually a technique to that. They aren't just willy nilly doing it. They're, there's quadrants and whatever. I digress. And then you put it in an incubator. Incubator, you bring it out, and then you actually will count the, the dots or the fuzz, if you will. And actually, this is how penicillin was found. Because if you guys did not know, penicillin is from soil. And one of the ways it was found was when they pulled out a petri dish and they looked at it and they noticed that there was nothing growing around this one area. There was a, a layer of inhibition and they noticed that that little microbe that was causing that inhibition was what could potentially cure humans from infection. And turns out it worked. Editing Ashley here. I just want to add something because it just, it didn't flow well, so I had to cut it out. But do not do the petri dish method at home. It's very important. 
uh, it's dangerous because yes, you can get your own agar plates and yada, yada, yada. But if you open it without an actual exhaust hood, like what actual soil microbiologists use, it's dangerous stuff. So just keep that in mind. When I've worked with it in a lab, you couldn't even like, it was taped and you had it under exhaust hoods and, and everything else. So please don't do this at home. What I will say though, is I have seen penicillin actually in dishes before. And it was a sample I took from the river, actually by the water treatment plant in Saskatoon, like the, where the water comes out. So just fun fact, I've personally seen this layer in a vision. What we use now, because we're more refined, is actually something called sequencing of 16 srRNA. Big fancy word for looking at very, very small factors in the soil and the density of them. No, that, that 16 srRNA, oof, right? Say that five times fast. That is mostly for bacteria. Now, this is where soil scientists have failed you. I'm sorry. I know I do it on three times a week on Sunday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and I apologize. I'm going to do it here again today. We don't actually know how much is in those lower layers because we haven't really taken the time to look at it. We are now because we realize our blunder, but previously we haven't. So our current understanding is from zero, the surface, to about 25 centimeters. That is a layer that we know is good. 200 centimeters is where the plant roots go. And if you've ever heard me talk about rhizosphere, you probably know that the rhizosphere in its entirety is important. And the reason why that rhizosphere is important is because that is where the roots uptake the nutrients. Equally as important in those lower layers of our soil system is that it is very responsible for carbon sequestration, which is something we want to understand a little bit better, as well as nutrient cycling does take place in those lower layers, despite the fact that there is less oxygen. So the lower layers are equally as important as the upper layers, and the more drought years we have or you have can actually lend credence to that being even more true because one of the factors that microbes need is moisture. And if your top layer, your upper layer of soil is dried out because of too much heat from either the sun or ambiently resulting in too much, I'll use another big word on you, I'm sorry, evapotranspiration. The geek crew already knows what that is. I, the rest of you, you need to join to know what that is. And actually, the geek crew, can one of you explain it down below because I don't want to put it on the screen. I want to see how much you guys are actually learning on this channel. So check out the comments for what that definition means. The higher rates of evapotranspiration simply mean that there is not going to be much moisture. And the lack of moisture means no microbes because the microbes actually live in the water. They actually reside in those lower la levels, layers, levels, whatever. They reside closer to hell <laughs> where the redheads live. They reside in those lower, la la lower <laughs> layers. The blooper reel on this thing is going to be unbelievable. They result, they live in the lower levels of the soil system in their isosphere, and uh, that will be valuable as we have more drought here. Now, keep in mind, saturated soil is also equally as dangerous because it causes an anaerobic condition. So that's where the compaction video comes in because we don't want pooling water and we don't want water that moves through the soil profile and gets hung up somewhere, like on a hard pan, for example. So number one is actually keeping up your soil moisture. Now you can obviously do that through irrigation, but you can also do that through mulch. And I love mulch. I don't do anything fancy for mulch. I use leaves, I use straw. I got from Jessica from Ocropia, because they've got animals. And I use cut grass, or I used to use cut grass before I decimated my front yard and made it all a garden. And my dogs rip up all the grass in the backyard. So there's that too. The next one we can look at is that scientists understand diversity. So I've spoken about diversity from the standpoint of mixing flowers with tomatoes or from the perspective of putting lettuce with tomatoes, so tall crops with short crops, for the purpose of getting more pollinators and more food. Turns out that diversity also helps you win with microbes because every plant releases its own version of McDonald's or Burger King, we call them exudates, 
And those sugars that are released actually attract different microbes. And those different microbes do different things in regards to nutrient cycling, for example. So legumes. So diversity is one way in plants, roots, is one way to actually increase microbes without any additions. Another way is just through inputs like compost and manures. I always say switch it up. You mushroom compost one year, vegetable compost the next, cow manure one year, sheep manure the next. Just switch it up. They're probably mostly the same, but it makes you feel a little bit better. Which brings me into my next point, which is organics. Their food source, what they eat. So, Yes, they eat the compost and manure, but they can also eat the roots of the plants. So more diversity when it comes to the organic matter source results in better food or more food for them. This is why when I did my how to close down a garden in the fall video, I said cut the stems off at the top and or leave them in place entirely. And then in the spring, go in and cut the plants off at their, at their base. It's because the root biomass left behind not only is food, but it channels air into the soil system as they decompose, as the microbes eat them. Now, the end result of decomposition is, is humus and CO2. CO2 is the carbon sequestration portion that we're talking about, where the carbon gets pulled out of the air and put into the ground. So it's pulled out of the air by the plant, put into the ground, and then the microbes decomposed it, and now it's really locked in. That is CO2 capture. The humus portion is the fluffy stuff. If you have fluffy soil, light soil, that is a result of organic material. And that is caused by those plant roots being lower in that soil system. Something here to note is nutrient cycling is different than nutrient mobility. And I want to clarify that particularly before we get into the solution for getting more microbes. Nutrient cycling is the biogeochemical geochemical process of cycling nutrients. Nutrient mobility is how the nutrient moves through a system, meaning some nutrients are water soluble and they can be washed away by water. Others are not or immobile and stuck inside the soil. It also refers to how it moves through the plants itself as a whole. So keep that in mind. These are two separate things and people do use them interchangeably but they're not. Just when I thought I escaped the throes of winter and bad weather, it's like a nice light sleet outside. So we're gonna finish it off in here. So one way you can test this at home, I swear to you, I would never lie, is to actually take a cotton piece of fabric, whether that's underwear or socks and dig it into your soil system. Now, one way to see what you have at the different layers of your soil system, so upper layer versus lower layer, is to potentially put in different forms of organic uh, material at different heights in your soil system, if you're particularly interested in that. What you want to do is you want to mark off that space, take a weight of this product before you put it in the ground, or you can just visually note what it looks like. <laughs> before you put it in the ground because trust me it'll be drastically different later and all you do is you dig those into the ground and you then dig them up in six months a year whatever you choose and you're looking for some degradation if it's degrading quickly meaning in six months it's nearly gone probably an indication you have pretty good microbe colonization and hangout space if it's really, really slow, it could be an indication of something in the edaphic factors not being correct. And usually, particularly in the lower le levels, it's either oxygen or it is too much water. How do you fix it? Don't agree with. So mycorrhizal fungi, for example, because I personally think it's kind of junk. Um, not, not in all cases, don't get me wrong. There are applications in which it works. Most gardeners, however, there's no reason. And I did a video on garden gimmicks and that one made the list. So if you want to check that out, go do that. The only one that I do agree with, and I could keep in mind, I could be biased because I have done research in this world, and that is rhizobium bacteria. So rhizobium bacteria is what you find on legumes and that can actually be be massaged into the seed is what we did. You don't have to, you can just inoculate the seed or inoculate the space that the microbes or that the seeds are going into. And the only reason you would add more is because 
it just helps with the colonization process. It helps the nitrogen fixation happen a little bit quicker, and it's just a tad bit stronger. And a tad bit can be a lot in the world of microbes. So if you look at inoculated roots, which is the word for ones that have been exposed to excess rhizobium bacteria, you'll see more nodulation. And that is because you put more rhizobium bacteria there. If you don't want to spend the money, you can just plant peas or beans or legumes in the same spot repeatedly, and over time, you will colonize more rhizobium bacteria without the addition of it, if that makes sense. And trust me, that is like my favorite microbe. Number two is to work on the soil texture and or the physical properties and chemical properties to an extent of your soil. pH is a factor in your soil's health, and I stress this a number of different ways because it actually affects nutrient uptake as well. That is a hard one to change, very difficult. I'm gonna do a video about that here this summer. One thing you can change though is the amount of oxygen, the soil porosity, and the overall structure of your soil, particularly in a small garden setting. So what you wanna do is watch the video on how to determine what soil texture you have, and then you need to take the proper appropriate steps to make the appropriate sized soil porosity, if you will. Now, really based way to do this is to put organic material on the soil surface and then till it in if you've never tilled before. I know it's sacrilegious, but what that will do is it'll move the food for the microbes into those lower lo layers, and you might not be able to get it to the lowest portion of the layer, but you can work its way in to a point through the layers. Once you get the organics in the layers, you also have you know temporary influx of oxygen. You only have to do this once classically speaking, and that organic material will hang out there for around five years as a, as a nutrient source. But within that five years, you're constantly going to be adding root biomass. You're not going to yank out plants anymore in the fall. You're going to cut them at the base and that will give you your soil structure. After that one time till, you should never need to till again, unless there's some circumstances that you've done in the video I'm going to do about compaction. So bottom line takeaways is that adaptive factors is what affects the microbes and whether or not they survive. And you need to work on those adaptive factors to make their house a home, if you will. The next one is you don't have to add microbes, just simply diversity, both in inputs as well as plants will help increase the micro populations and don't get hung up on products. Products are not going to save you. Your soil is not dead. It's never dirt. I can promise you that. Even if there's nothing growing there, there are microbes. All we need to do is colonize more of them in that space. The way to do that is through plants. So, and if you don't have anything in the space and you're like, no, 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 this is hard, dead dirt, then you would want to add the organic material through tillage, one time application, and that will allow you to speed off into the sunset with better soil structure. That's really starting to sleep now, so I'm gonna go inside. Okay, so microbes, let's get into it. After I drink Mickey Mouse. Oh, heck. Mm. Too far, too far.